Hello, Booktube. I have a little mail for you here. It's on a, a nice warm Monday. <laughs> when we've, got, uh, we've got weather in the offing. The Boston area, the, the remnants of a hurricane that are, that are slowly crawling up the eastern seacoast. Apparently, by all the, the information that I've seen, that those remnants will strike New England tomorrow. Uh, and could be a, a, a gusty, blustery day with maybe lots of rain and maybe a little thunder and lightning. I myself think that there's, just looking at the, at the, the raw data, I think there's a real good chance that this doesn't hit New England at all, that, that the skies don't even cloud over. But if it happens, it could be a very blustery day, and it's pushing warm, humid air ahead of it. Uh, that is a godsend to me, although not not necessarily to uh, to my Frida Bean, <laughs> who is right there as usual. She's within arm's reach of me at all times. She's uh, she had a little bit of a little bit of a moment last night. We went on a uh, we go on a the last walk of the day at sunset, uh, and we were up in, on a, a again a, a quiet little leafy side street. And the light was failing. The light, the light was definitely failing, and she doesn't like that. One of the reasons why our last walk of the evening tends to be at sunset is because she really doesn't like walking in the dark at all. She jumps at shadows. She distrusts her own hearing. She gets spooked when we walk at night. She doesn't like it at all. So I, well, we'll do it. We'll obviously have to do it in the winter. Uh, but last night, the, it was the gloaming. There was there was light, but it was fading. And yet, she became spooked, very much so, and started growling under her breath, and then barked a couple of times at nothing. Just There was no one anywhere around. Just beautiful houses on all sides, a totally quiet, empty street and sidewalk. No one anywhere around. I think that I, I was able to detect just a tiny bit of what was getting to her. I think she was walking in the scent trail of something that had just been on the sidewalk maybe five minutes before we got there and maybe vacated because of us, because it's, it hurt us coming. Uh, and the reason that it was getting to her, that it was working on her like that, is because she didn't recognize what it was. So uh, <laughs> that started off a process of elimination in my own mind because she's met a few things, including alpacas. <laughs> uh, and raccoons. The, the, the number one suspect would be raccoons. But uh, it wasn't a raccoon, because she's met them before. And she might not like a raccoon, you know, interfering with her walk, but she wouldn't act the way she did. The way her reaction last night was alarm. The kind of alarm that she reserves for things she doesn't, that she's never encountered before. And I was thinking it was, there had just been a very humid, very brief rainstorm. There was fog hanging all around, a heavy, humid atmosphere. And I thought, well, who likes to come out and walk around in weather like that? Possums do. And she's never met a possum. Never come anywhere near one. So it could have been that we... That we... Sorry for the bouncing. She is going nuts. What is the matter with you? Notice the floor there, huh? Huh? Well, uh, <laughs> Hello, baby. <laughs> Uh, will you settle down? <laughs> the floor in the corner there, I took the, the liberty of cleaning it. Got all the crap up off the floor, and I don't know if you can tell there in the corner, uh, the bottom bookcase there had a whole bunch of files of papers and whatnot. And I thought, this, these are bookshelves. These aren't paper shelves, so I cleaned them out. So I now have what, what those of you who, are, who deal, as all of you do, with very limited library shelf space will, will know. I now have the absolute joy of a totally empty shelf in this room. <laughs> it's on the floor, granted, but I have to figure out what to do with that empty shelf. Oh my, a whole shelf that's empty. So that's a shelf worth of books that I can add to this room. I can shift things all around. Oh, it's a massive amount of planning that I've been doing. That's why, that's why I, it's been empty for a couple of days. I've just been paralyzed with planning. But anyway, I have some mail. Uh, we have some mail here. Two packages, not much. Uh, but we'll see what we have here. I've got my... Yeah! <laughs> got my, my mail disposal unit right here. <laughs> I adore this dog. Uh, Alright, so the first one is from Europa Editions. Uh, this is by Karen Powell. And it is called uh, The River Within. 
Okay, so I don't have a... I don't think I have any... Oh, okay, this is what it's going to look like. I, the cover... I just have an advanced copy here. And the advanced copy says, uh, in addition to this is non-corrected proof, not for resale, all that sort of thing, it also has a declaration on it, uh, which is kind of rare. Uh, the River Within will surely take its place as a classic in the tradition of English fiction that takes in Thomas Hardy, Graham Swift, and Helen Dunmore. Uh, no attribution there. That, that must come from, from the publisher. Uh, but what have we got here? What is the description? No, there's no sense holding this up because that's not what it's going to look like. Lady Venetia Richmond has no time to dwell on the death. Newly widowed, she is busy trying to keep the estate together while struggling with death duties and crippling taxation. Alexander, her son and sole heir to Richmond Hall, is of little help. Just when she most needs him, he grows elusive, his behavior becoming increasingly erratic. Lenny Fairweather, child of nature and daughter of the late Sir Angus's private secretary, has other things on her mind too. In love with Alexander, she longs to escape life with her overprotective father and domineering brother. Alexander is unpredictable, though, hard to pin down. Can she be sure of his true feelings towards her? In the weeks that follow the tragic drowning, I guess, I guess Lord Richmond drowned? Uh, in the weeks that follow the tragic drowning, the river begins to give up its secrets. As the truth about Danny's death emerges, I guess Danny is Lord Richmond? Uh, uh, other stories come to the surface that threaten to destroy everyone's plans for the future and ultimately their way of life. Okay. All right, so an, in, an English country story set, uh, it doesn't sound like it's set in the present day at all. Uh, let's see here, let's see if we can figure this out. Uh, okay, well the first chapter is set in 1955. Um, yeah, this is set in the 50s, it's set in 1955. Okay, and the author, Karen Powell, was born in Rochester, Kent, and left school at 16, but returned to education as a mature student to study English literature at Lucy Cavendish College, Cambridge. She lives in North Yorkshire. An early draft of The River Within was awarded a Northern Writers TLC New Fiction Reads Prize, which seeks to support works in progress by new emerging and established writers across the north of England. Didn't know such a prize existed. Okay, so this is gonna come out in hardcover, uh, and the date on it is the 1st of December. Uh, so it's a just a, a classic leaning country novel okay uh, a piercingly evocative novel rooted in the landscape of North Yorkshire so oh, the back of the book has a lot of information on it. uh, it's, it's the summer of 1955 Alexander Tom and his sister Lenny discover the body of their childhood friend Danny Masters in the river that runs through Starham a village on the Richmond estate in North Yorkshire his death is a mystery. Did he jump, or was it just an accident? Okay, so it's not. Danny is not his lordship. Uh, Lady Venetia Richmond has no time to dwell on the death. Newly widowed. Oh, okay, all right. So the pub sheet was just missing an, uh, a paragraph. That's all. Is it maybe on this first page? Oh, God, it is. How do you like that? All right. Okay, well, I really ought to get more practice in it reading about books. Let's see. All right, well, fine. Okay, so uh, so the all, important, <laughs> the all important first paragraph was missing from my reading. But that's okay. Uh, so this comes out on December 1st uh, from Europa Editions. I, it, the, uh, the date on the book is August. That has obviously been, been moved for obvious reasons. Uh, that's great. Europa Editions and I go way back. I think they're fantastic. So, uh, so that's great. I won't, it's, I mean, it's December 1st, so I won't read it right away. But, uh, and then we have this next one. The section is in a priority mail envelope, so it may not be from a publisher. It may be from one of you. Uh, but it, it definitely feels like a book, and so it better not be from one of you, because uh, Mega Stuff Oreos notwithstanding, we have already laid down the law, don't send me a book. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> Unless it's an ebook. You can send me all the ebooks you want. <laughs> send it, uh, your EPUB books, you can send all those that you want. Baby, this is plastic. Plastic is not, <laughs> plastic is not good for little beans. All right, just chew, though. Don't eat. <laughs> she won't eat it anyway, though. She's too smart for that. Oh, fantastic. Oh. Oh, boy. Oh, fantastic. Oh. Okay. Oh, wonderful. All right, I believe this is an author I have referred to on this channel before and brought to your attention before. 
Uh, and boy, oh boy, oh, this is a joy. Do we have a date on it? I want to read this now. I suppose I will read it now. It doesn't doesn't really matter. Uh, this this author is Janet Wortman. I think I've mentioned her on this channel before. She self-publishes her books, and they are Tudor historical fiction, and they're terrific. Absolutely terrific. Started out with Jane the Queen, and then moved on to The Path to Somerset. So you, you can you can figure out it's Jane Seymour, it's the Somerset. You, you can figure out uh, who we're talking about here. And the brothers Seymour and whatnot. And if it starts out with Jane Seymour and, and it, it, the second book in the series is The Path to Somerset, you can guess what the third book will be, and you would be right. <laughs> the third book is called The Boy King, and it is about Edward. It's about King Henry's, the King Henry VIII's only legitimate male heir. Uh, what have we got here? There's no, there's no pub sheet, uh, but I do, <laughs> I do have what the author's note refers to as swag. <laughs> I've got a couple of bookmarks here. Fantastic. All right, so what have we got here? Uh, motherless since birth and newly bereft of his father, Henry VIII, nine-year-old Edward Tudor ascends to the throne of England and quickly learns that he cannot trust anyone, even himself. Edward is at first relieved that his, that his uncle, the new Duke of Somerset, will act on his behalf as Lord Protector. But this consolation evaporates as jealousy spreads through the court. Je <laughs> okay, all right. It's Monday, so it's Mailbag Monday over at SFF 180, and I just saw Thomas at SFF 180 encounter this exact same problem in a self-published advanced copy of a book, which is that the banner, not for resale, runs right through the copy you're supposed to read on the back of the book. I guess the number of us who are reading that copy on camera is relatively small, but, uh, okay, well, anyway, I can, let me see. Yeah. Challengers, are, I'm going to read through the not for sale banner. Challengers arise on all sides to wrest control of the child, of the child king. I can't read the rest of it. Okay, but then we move on. While Edward can bring frustratingly little direction to the council's policies, he refuses to abandon his one firm conviction that Catholicism has no place in England. When Edward falls ill, this steadfast belief threatens England's best hope for a smooth succession. The transfer of the throne to Edward's very Catholic half-sister Mary Tudor, whose heart's desire is to return the realm to the ways of its wor uh, it worshipped in her mother's day. And that is where the, uh, the description stops. Uh... And this is of deep and abiding interest to me. <laughs> deep and abiding interest. Not only because I love the Tudors, and I love Tudor fiction, but also because for NaNoWriMo one year, I wrote a book, a first-person narrative of the life of Edward, called The Boy King. I called it Boy King. I didn't use the, the, the direct article there. But nevertheless, I have been over the exact same primary sources. I've been over the exact same court calendars. Everything that Janet Wortman has been over in this book. And the joy of that is not that I will be able to say, oh, I did it different, but rather that I am completely on the same page with the author of this piece of historical fiction. I will know right away the artistic decisions that she decided to make. They'll be different from the ones I made, uh, but they, but that makes them all the more fascinating, not all the less. I will, in other words, the the one of the great uh, smile-inducing things about a book like this for me is that I will know exactly where the author's invention comes in. I'll be able to see that invention clear in a way that I maybe wouldn't be able to see in a historical fiction about a subject or a person or a time period that I didn't know quite so well. I have written this book. <laughs> I've written this book myself. I know exactly where you have to go to to study every every single moment of Edward's life. I know exactly where you need to go and then I know I am familiar with uh that moment when you are a writer of historical fiction and you have done all of your legwork. This is a very very thorough researcher. So I'm sure that Janet Wortman has done all of the research that I did. Maybe more. But there comes that moment once you've done all that research, there comes that moment where you say, "Okay, well, I'm not writing a life of Edward. I'm writing a novel." So I'm going to do some things, and here are the things that I'm going to do. And I, that, the, the, that moment when you jump off from your vast fact catalog is fascinating to me. That is the origin. That is the, the, very, the very origin point of historical fiction. I can't wait. In fact, I won't wait. I, I, I only got the two books here. One is for December. I don't know the date on this. I'll have to check, but it doesn't matter. I'll read it a couple of times. I'll read it ahead of time first. Uh, oh, how fantastic. 
how utterly fantastic. Uh, let's read about the author. That That is our author right there. She is an indie author. Uh, these books are easily good enough, easily, for HarperCollins or Viking to just pick up and run, easily. Janet Wortman is a perfect example, in my mind, of indie publishing done right. Where, yes, these are these are perfect candidates. They they are finished work. She's obviously done all of the research, all of the writing, and then hired people to help with the design of the book, with the editing of the book. She is a perfect example in my mind of indie publishing done right. And maybe that's the reason why she wouldn't maybe be interested in Hachette or or Crown or whatever, because why would she bother? Why would she bother if she, if she already has a completely professional-looking product that can go directly to readers? And if you read Tudor historical fiction, you should be one of those readers. Here, my swag, my my swag actually lets me show you what the books look like. That is the cover for uh, Jane the Queen, the old spelling of Queen. And then this is the cover. There he is himself. There is Edward. Uh, you've got the Path to Somerset. That is what the cover of that book looks like. These are not, strictly speaking, uh, a, you know, a, a directly organic series of sequences. So you can read them in any order. Uh, but I strongly recommend those first two books. They are very, very good. Uh, and I have no doubt that this book will be very, very good. I wonder if Janet Workman would be interested in having a wee chat <laughs> on camera I mean oh that would be fun oh but anyway let's see by day Janet Wortman is a freelance grant writer for great nonprofits. <laughs> a little echo there of the adventures of Superman by night she writes historical fiction she has harbored a passion for the Tudor era since she was eight years old and her parents let her stay up late to watch the six wives of Henry VIII and Elizabeth R two great BBC productions in multi-parts that are just amazing. Glenda Jackson as Elizabeth in Elizabeth R is incredible. Incredible. Uh, she also runs a blog Janet, uh, at JanetWartman.com where she posts interesting takes on the tutors and what it's like to write about them. Okay, well, this is a natural progression in her sequence of tutor novels because this is Jane Seymour's son. So, and it sounds like uh, he does not live the book. I don't think you could do more than one book on, on Edward. He was he died very young. And it sounds from the description like I can already guess one of those jumping points, jumping off points for this author that will be different from the ones that I took. Uh, because I studied the same records and I don't see any evidence that Edward got sick. I, don't, I especially don't see evidence that he was sickly for his whole life, I, which is a standard thing that you'll read even in Tudor biographies today. I think he was a hale and healthy boy and something catastrophic happened to him that ended his life. Whether that was poison or just one of the catastrophic illnesses that you could just, just get just by swinging a dead cat in the Tudor era, I don't know. But uh, we'll have to see that mention of him falling ill. We'll have to see how, how early in the book that happens and how long it's protracted. But I'm not going to be able to wait. I don't have it in me. <laughs> so I'm going to read this. I'm going to read this today. Uh, and uh, when the time comes, well, I haven't checked the date on this, but when the time comes, and this is a, an actual book, it won't be in your bookstores. Bookstores don't stock indie books, even if they look as good as this one will, uh, which is a terrible shame. The, one, the, the indie books that, that chin up to the bar and are as professional as the standard industry books ought to be in bookstores. Uh, but one way or another, when this comes out in a finished copy, I will recommend it to you. <laughs> I, I strongly recommend this series and this author. Uh, so that's fantastic. What a joy. I've got to, I, well, uh, as we've often mentioned, my mail halls, and my Brattle book hauls often constitute my TBR for that day. I've done a lot of reading today. A lot of reading today. Because <laughs> it's, it's too hot to take Frida on walks every hour. So we've, we've been cooped up inside. Uh, but very often, the, the mail, the books that I get in the course of a day will constitute my TBR. Well, I will immediately go on my reading list. Something very satisfying in that, let me tell you. Uh, but I'm not going to read a December book today. Uh, I am going to read The Boy King today. <laughs> so, fantastic. Great. All right, two works of fiction, both historical fiction. Both sound interesting, but The Boy King is literally right up my alley. I've written extensively about Edward. I've, I've written, uh, I've, and I've published extensively about Edward. I've also written the novel. I've written a, a novel of Edward, so just like this author has. So there's no better simpatico there. What a fun, what treat it will be. So I'm going to wrap this up for now and get to work. I'm just going to read this on the couch right now. I'm not going to wait until tonight. So, uh, But anyway, I will, uh, if I remember, I will leave a link. I believe I wrote about Jane the Queen. I may even have written about the path to Somerset 
whatever I've written, whatever reviews I've I've done of this author, I'll leave down below. But <laughs> I strongly urge you to go and buy a copy of Jane the Queen. You can get I'm sure you can get an e copy, or you can get another nice thing about indie publishing is that the books are usually very reasonably priced as opposed to their bookstore cousins if you like Tudor historical fiction give it a try <laughs> but anyway I'm going to wrap this up uh, but I'll be back thank you book two